Welcome into College Football Daily. We're breaking down the top 25 recruiting classes of 2018 presented by Man Crates. Let's take it, guys, into the top 25. First up, we've got Maryland. 22 players committed right now. Yeah, so they've rose from 30 up to the top 25 since our last rankings on on signing day and December 20th. Guys, 22 total recruits, no five stars, three four stars. And they just piled on the three stars, Tom. 19 three stars led by Jalen Duncan and Austin Fontaine. I don't know if Maryland's going to finish in the top 25 because we'll see some teams get some other, other players as we get closer to signing day. But this, I think, is a good example of a team that is never going to get a bunch of five-star guys. But they're going to get solid volume, and that's going to get them near the top 25. One thing to keep in mind with DJ Durkin his last couple years at Maryland recruiting is they have been consistently in the top two top three for multiple five-star guys did have a couple guys committed both recruiting classes couldn't hold on to them mm -hmm. success in the field is going to lead to grabbing some of those guys holding on to them not even jump to Alabama or Ohio State or something Dwayne Haskins yep absolutely the Dwayne QB. Haskins a commitment now will be Ohio State starting quarterback <laughs> in 2018 most likely Maryland coming in at number 25 the rest of the top 25 recruiting classes of 2018 coming up right now Man crates, awesome gifts for men in real wooden crates, wrapped in a cocoon of duct tape, or housed in ammo cans that are virtually indestructible. Some gifts he'll get to assemble himself, some gifts you'll beg him to share, and some gifts are sealed inside layers of rock-solid concrete. Gifts guys love, from grilling gear to old-school video games and more. Man crates, awesome gifts for men. Hello and welcome into College Football Daily. I am your host, Jordan Giorgio. Alongside me are our college football analysts here at Chat Sports, Tom Downey and James Yoder. College Football Daily is presented by Man Crate's awesome gift packages for guys delivered in a wooden crate. Guys, I'm talking jerky grams, barware, and project kits, and much more. You can go ahead and get one today at mancrates.com. You've got the man meat bouquet. You can get one if you, you know, guys give roses. Ladies can give their guys the kind of bouquet of meat. It's just as a uh, exciting as a 12-pack as a of flowers that you get your lady Tom. I know you've received one from me in particular. <laughs> Hold on, I've never heard it referred to as a 12-pack of flowers. Ah, uh, 12-pack of Classic flowers. Guy hey, I'm thinking right beer here, right? Anything that's 12-pack, I'm thinking uh, 12, I'm thinking a 12-pack. But 12, 12, a dozen roses, a dozen things on meat from Man Crates. That'll make you feel like a man. I love their barware sets. Guys, the back of our office has Man Crates barware, cups, pints of beer, Texas Longhorns, Michigan, Dallas Cowboys, some ones they've sent us. I just love Man Crates. Go ahead and get one today, Man Crates. Dot com, the only way to gift for gentlemen in your life this, I guess, Valentine's Day there season. Eh? Perfect gift for Valentine's Day. Yeah. I don't want no flowers or chocolates. Most whatever. definitely. Man Give me a man crate. Is, man crate is the way to go. All right, guys, let's keep it rolling here on our top 25 recruiting classes of 2018. We'll take it now to number 24. We've got Baylor, you guys. One notable name up there, quarterback Jerry Bohannon, a big frames dueled quarterback, runs well for a quarterback of this size, and also wide receiver and quarterback B.J. Hans. He switched actually from wide receiver to cornerback in 2018 and helped submit a defense to capture a state championship for his high school. Getting a guy like Bahan, I think, is big for Baylor because overall with this class, this is kind of going to become the building block of Baylor going forward. And I'm very impressed that Baylor and Matt will be able to get guys like Bahan and actually have a top 25 class because – I kind of thought Baylor was just going to wither away and die. Tom, Apparently when not. When you think about last year when he came in and took this job, Matt Rule coming over uh, from Temple, they only had one recruit when he signed on to be their coach. Basically their entire recruiting class in the 2017 uh, class ditched them. He had to throw together you know, a dozen or so guys in the last month of the season when he took over that role. Now coming back, being in the top 25 with 23 players recruiting. I mean, we saw what happened to Penn State with you know, Bill O'Brien, now James Franklin. We're able to keep that thing stable and even winning at a higher level than they were under Joe Paterno, especially his last few years. If Rule can pull it off at Baylor, I'll tell you what, I'm, huge props to him, and I would hope that he would stick around for you know a long time given how challenging that job is to rebuild a Baylor program that most people had left for dead just a couple years off you know, away from competing for a college football national championship or playoff uh, berth in 2014. Three years later, they were left for dead, and now in 2018, they've got a top 25 recruiting class. Uh, the guys I like right there, we talked about Jerry Bohannon. He he is a great player. He'll be the quarterback that leads him back. Mm -hmm. All right, let's keep it rolling here, guys. Coming in at number 23, we've got Nebraska. They've got 20 players committed as of right now. 
This is a Nebraska class that has been very, very impressive to me in terms of what they've done. Last time we were on air, we are kind of discussing this in depth, James, during the, the early national yep. signing day period. Nebraska was not in the top 25. Then Scott Frost comes in, and he has done a great job of getting Nebraska into the top 25. I, I saw a GBR comment in the comment section. <laughs> Nebraska checks in here in the top 25. And the big guy to watch here is four-star quarterback, Adrian Martinez. He's already enrolled at, at, at Nebraska. He flipped from Tennessee. This is Scott Frost's guy. This is who he wanted to come be his quarterback at Nebraska. All eyes will be on him going forward. I think there's an actual chance that he wins a starting job at some point in his freshman year. Maybe not right away, but this is who Frost wants to run his offense. I mean, look what Frost did at UCF, and it's not often you see a, a coach of the uh, undisputed national champions jump to another school like Frost did from Central Florida to Nebraska. Uh, UCF joke, national championship joke uh, inserted there. Uh, pardon my laughter uh, from you guys. Yeah. Uh, so Martinez, though, reminds me of the quarterbacks and what he did at UCF. I mean, his entire team, Tom, basically this past year when they went undefeated 17-0, beat Auburn in uh, in the Peach Bowl, was all sophomores, right? It was all guys that he brought in with a month or less notice after leaving Oregon as their offensive coordinator uh, you know, th two years ago. So I see Martinez as being the building block of reviving this Nebraska franchise I, or this Nebraska program. I really relate this hire a lot to much. Urban Meyer going to Florida in 2005, Tom. It's like that hot coach that everybody wants, going to have his pick of jobs. You thought Urban Meyer was going to go to Notre Dame, then end up going to Florida because of money, ish, money issues and, of course, rumors that his wife didn't necessarily want to live in the cold. They're obviously debunked now that they're in Columbus. But <laughs> this is going to be a big impact uh, hire. I wouldn't be surprised if they pulled a couple of signing day surprises down the stretch here. They've turned this around. I mean, they were nowhere to be found a month ago. Now they're in the top 25. And I'll mention this with Nebraska. This is such a good start for them this year. And then next year, Frost is going to have what is going to be his first true recruiting class when he has time to to get going early in the process. At this point, he's playing catch-up right now, and he's still on top of it. I am very impressed. If we think about just coaches in the Big Ten that have done this, and we'll talk a little more about Nebraska here, is Urban Meyer's first full recruiting class, kind of like you talked about, like his first full year, those next class, what Scott Frost been going for in 2019, that was the class that, inc that included guys like Ezekiel Elliott and, and Joey Bosa that led them to a national title in 2014. So Frost will probably be kind of like bringing in that same crop of guys next year, but this class in 2018 is the ones that are going to take them from a few wins to potentially 7, 8, 9 in 2018, his first year on campus. Nebraska lands that number 23 spot. Moving on, guys, at number 22, they fell from one spot from 21, the Virginia Tech Hokies. 24 total recruits right now. No five-star guys, though. Yeah, I mean, so they, they dropped just one spot. They were 21, now they're 22. So no five stars, four four stars, like you said, Jordan. Just like some other schools, really piling on the three stars, a volume recruiting class. A lot of guys you'll see hit or miss. I'm sure half this, you know, a third of this class will never contribute, but they'll find some diamonds in the rough. And that's what Virginia Tech has done for the last 25 years. They find those higher rated three star guys that don't get the offers from the, let's say, Florida States and Clemsons and even the Penn States on the East Coast. They end up at Virginia Tech and they turn into stars out. Uh, out in Blacksburg. So Quincy Patterson is the star of this class, a top 300 player overall. Now, he's got some nice size, some nice movement from uh, the Chicago area. So heading out to Virginia Tech is going to be a little bit of a culture shock, someone who's been to Blacksburg like myself. But he is the one to keep an eye on, guys. Now, they did start a redshirt freshman quarterback in Blacksburg this year. So Patterson will probably be on the bench for a couple years, but could be one that, you know, brings some more competition to that quarterback role that it really lacked in 2008 and 17. Mm. All right. The Hokies land that number 22 spot. Moving on at number 21, we've got TCU. Guys, one notable guy up there, quarterback Justin Rogers, top 2018 quarterback in Louisiana. He combines great arm strength and velocity with dangerous running ability. A great get there for the Horned Frogs. I think it's a common theme for TCU in general is they're not afraid to go into LSU's territory and say, okay, we're going to poach some of these big name guys. And TCU, as these have gone, have gone on, have had a much higher success rate than they would have had, you know, five, ten years ago. I think part of that is making the big jump to the Big 12. But I'm a big fan of what TCU does. They're not going to be a top ten recruiting class for the most part, but Gary Patterson is going to get the most out of these guys. And with Kenny Hill leaving, Justin Rogers could be an early starter for TCU. He's got the athletic ability on the upside. Maybe Patterson says, hey, let's put Justin in now. 
grow through some growing pains, and be set up really good for the future. And if TCU can start recruiting, you know, at the top half of the Big 12, now that they've been in that conference for what, five, six years now, Tom, we saw what he's been able to do there, Patterson, over the last 16, 17 seasons he's been coached. If they can start adding top-rated recruiting classes to the already superb player, player development and, and coaching and play calling they get at TCU, you're going to see them get back into the top 10 consistently like they were last year, like they've been in the last few years. So Justin Rogers, a guy I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Jordan, we will have on Chat Sports on our signing day special with an exclusive interview uh, next Wednesday. So keep an eye out for that. Justin Rogers will be talking mm -hmm. to us. Top 50 player, getting him out of the state. It is very rare to see a school like TCU, which is more of a regional brand, pull in a top 50 player nationally, specifically a quarterback, out of state in the state of Louisiana. Didn't go to LSU, didn't go to Alabama, Georgia, any of the other schools. He is coming here mm -hmm. to the Dallas-Fort Worth area to go to TCU, and that's a big one. I can't wait to watch him play in person, guys. Yeah, mm -hmm. and another guy we should mention up there is safety Antonza Von Gore, one of the top defensive prospects in the state of Texas. Combined with that size, speed, and overall athleticism, it's a great get for TCU. I like, I like to see TCU, which historically has been one of the lesser programs in the state of Texas mm -hmm. annually in the South area, able to get some of these big-name guys. It does good things for the parity in college football. Yeah, I absolutely. like it. Yep. All right, before we get into the top 20, let's go ahead and recap our first five Top 2018 recruiting classes so far. At number 25, we've got Maryland, followed by Baylor, Nebraska, Virginia Tech, and TCU at number 21. Taking it now to number 20, guys, we've got South Carolina. This is a Gamecock team that's kind of hung around this spot for much of the early signing day period and all this. This is a, a very talented team in terms of what they've been able to recruit. Will Muschamp, has, he did a good job recruiting in Florida. Yeah. Now, maybe he wasn't the best on-field coach nope. and his offense always had <laughs> issues, but he was always able to recruit pretty well at South Carolina. Josh Van is, is the big one this year. Number 146 overall, went into Georgia, poached him. Of course, Georgia couldn't get everyone this year from the state of Georgia, which you know, would be a loaded class for that state overall. Number 25 at wide receiver, he's already signed. I think he'll end up being pretty good for, for South Carolina. One of the guys that, that I'll briefly mention here as well is J.C. Horn. The last name should ring a bell here. Joe Horn's, Joe Horn's son? son. Really? That's exactly son, what like, it is. Is he, is he yeah. too old to be his younger brother? I guess Joe Horn's been yeah. retired for probably 15-plus years, so that has got to be his son. Interesting. I, time, you know you're old when you remember some of these guys and now their sons are playing in college football. That's <laughs> when you know you're old. And you're much younger than I am, so how, yes, imagine I am. how I feel at this point. So, so with South Carolina, uh, Dakar and Joyer is the dual-threat quarterback. Could be a starter maybe next year if Jake, if Jake Bentley decides to leave early. But this is a solid class for South Carolina. I just don't think that another example of program that you're not going to see typically in the top 10 and the top 15. That's sure. just not who they are. All right, guys. Well, let's take it to a quick reaction poll. Which team so far that we've seen recruiting class have surprised you the most? Give me a heart for South Carolina, a like for Nebraska, a wow face for Baylor, or a ha-ha for Maryland. Guys, what are you throwing up? You know, for me, and it's I don't want to disrespect teams like Nebraska or South Carolina, but it's almost a runaway vote for Baylor because I really thought that this Baylor program – was just going to wither away and die after after the gigantic mess that they found themselves in under Art Bryles. And then Matt Rule's come in, and he's managed to put together a top 25 recruiting class this far. Now maybe that changes once we get to the final signing day period. But for Baylor to be where they're at is wildly impressive and surprising to me. Yeah, I mean, Tom, it is definitely Baylor without question. I will say Nebraska potentially is my number two on that list because they just had – basically they were dead man walking for an entire year, so mm -hmm. no one was recruiting with any confidence that yeah. I'm going to be here long term, I'm going to be your coach in 2018, 19, beyond. And Scott Frost coached the bowl game with UCF, so he had limited time. So for them to jump into the top 25, that is a big deal. So Baylor is a clear number one because people left him for dead. I would say Nebraska is kind of a, a 1A on that for me. But yeah. – uh, Exciting to see what both those schools are doing, kind of reviving their programs through recruiting. So before we get into the top 20, just a reminder, we are presented by Man Crates. Jordan, let's jump into the top 20. All right, let's take it into number oh, I guess 19. 19, huh? yeah, yeah. We're, yeah, you're jumping in. All right, that, at number 19, guys, we've got Tennessee. They actually fell from number 17 to 19. Yeah, so Tennessee is surprising in general because how are they have this many guys who want to come to Tennessee with all the uncertainty they had over the last six months at their program? Butch Jones was a dead man walking. He couldn't recruit with any real confidence. And we saw the best player at their, you know, their, in their city went to, what, Georgia, the offensive lineman we talked about on signing day. So very surprising for them to keep this class together. Almost 20 players uh, committed. And I've been checking up on Tennessee, see how they're doing. How is Greg Pruitt doing, uh, Jeremy Pruitt, I'm sorry, uh, doing in the, in the 
early times. And, and he's doing a pretty good job bringing him sort of that Saban cachet of, uh, of dominating SEC recruiting with him. And uh, I, I, I think they're back on the right track. And it's, it's amazing when you see some of these programs, Penn State or Ohio State, Tennessee, you switch a coach, you get the right guy in there. Things can change overnight for you. So excited to see. We saw it with Kirby Smart. One year, they're back in the national title game. They're Philosophical title game. question for you, James. Is 19 about right for what Tennessee should be recruiting at? Is it too low or is it even too high? <laughs> I think well, I think it's if they're in the here two years from now, if they're at 19, I think you'll be disappointed, right? I think if they are going to be back at the upper echelon, top 15 program, you know, year in, year out, you do have to recruit. I know this might sound like a weird thing to say, but if you want to be a top 15 program, you got to recruit in the top 10 or 12 because you're always going to have those schools like the TCUs or like even Baylor's, uh, Stanford's that don't recruit in the top 20 that always are in mm -hmm. there. So to recruit at that t level of the SEC, you always have to be in the top 10 to be kind of up there and not lose four or five games. So Brewitt's got a, got a heck of a job in front of him, but the Tennessee brand sells nationally and certainly sells throughout the southeast in cities like Charlotte, Atlanta, and beyond. All right, Tennessee comes in at number 19. Guys, let's keep it rolling here. At number 18, we got the UCLA Bruins. One guy that I want to mention here is Dorian Thompson Robinson. Number two dual threat quarterback recruit in 2018. He wasn't a starting quarterback, guys, until his senior year. He actually played wide receiver his whole junior season. Well, that's going to be Tate Martell, who is at Ohio State as a true freshman right now. Sat there in front of him for three years at Bishop Gorman. One of the great programs in America for putting out uh, top high school prospects. They put out six of the top 150 guys this year. One high school, Bishop Gorman, probably the best program over the past five years in all of college football. Now, Dorian Thompson Robinson... Does he have the opportunity to start in year one under Chip Kelly? I don't know, right? So he has he was clearly highly ranked. He was a top 50 player before even taking a snap at quarterback coming into his senior year and was thought of a guy who might go into to the Midwest. He looked at Ohio State like his, his, uh, his teammate Tate Martell, looked at Notre Dame. Michigan was a school he looked at. Arizona was a school he looked at. Ultimately settled on UCLA uh, and, and under a coaching staff that was going downhill uh, under Jim Moore Jr. and now Chip Kelly coming in there. So I think he fits what Chip Kelly wants, but he is very limited experience. Tom, it would be the equivalent of draft a guy in the NFL who had started like eight games in college, right? It's very in the first <laughs> shot. And starting him from day one as a true as a rookie. So that's what's going on. He has had probably fewer snaps of any top 100 quarterback I can ever remember in my life. So to expect him to play in year one at quarterback, I'm sorry, I just don't see it happening. Maybe give him a red shirt year, let him kind of get acclimated to, to playing the position, and then you make it the move the year after that. Because you know that Chip Coe is going to have plenty of leeway. Yep. If you say he has a bad year next year, it's going to be like, it's fine. We, we're not going to fire Chip Kelly. Like, come on. We're, yeah. And we're I, not dumb. The one thing about Chip Kelly, though, too, uh, on just recruiting and, and getting players in their instant impact, guys, is they didn't get the quarterback. Thompson Robinson was the top 50 guy. Mm -hmm. I don't think he's ready to play, though, so I would keep a lookout. Can Chip Kelly bring in a dual threat grad transfer in the next you know few months? A lot of these guys will graduate April idea. and May, and I think Chip Kelly, just like Jim Harbaugh did when he was at Michigan, didn't come in with a strong quarterback situation. Just basically put the word out. You want to start next year? Come to UCLA. I think you'll get a lot of takers, guys, who got passed over or would make more sense in his system than the system that they're currently in and maybe a more pro-style West Coast system with whatever coach they're under. I like that a lot. The Bruins come in at number 18. Moving on, guys, at number 17, we've got Dan Mullins, Florida Gators. This has been an interesting first class for Dan Mullen and, and Florida because they were ranked a little bit higher. They peaked as high as 15 mm -hmm. in that fluctuation period known as, as the early signing day period. They've kind of settled in at 17. Emory Jones was, of course, the big get. Now, it's worth mentioning that he's 85th right now. Mm -hmm. That He dropped. He was ranked as, as high as 40 at one point in this early signing period, and then he fell once the recruiting service kind of adju adjusted everything. So now it's like, eh, is Emory Jones really the big get everyone thought, or did, did, his, did, did his switching from Ohio State drop in the eyes of Alex? Because we see that. We see, like, where you go drastically impacts how you're ranked, which, mm -hmm. I mean, I get, but... Tom, let me talk about this. You know my disdain for Urban Meyer, but I yes. will say this. When Urban Meyer loses a guy, a guy who was, you know, a year and a half ago when Emory Jones is kind of finishing up his sophomore year time, some people were comparing him to Justin Fields and Trevor Lawrence as maybe mm -hmm. the best player in the entire class, all those guys out of the state of Georgia, which is phenomenal to say in itself. He dropped like a stone in the rankings, and if he didn't switch to Florida, if he didn't, didn't uh, uh, you know, if he didn't stick with Ohio State for so long, if he would have decommitted earlier, maybe he would have drafted out of the top 100. Mm -hmm. He is the Kareem Walker of 2018. Ooh. I don't think it's an aspect of, of, of him choosing Florida. I don't think Urban Meyer was returning his calls. I think they got enough footage on him from his senior year 
like this guy is not the quarterback that's going to lead us to Big Ten or college football playoffs. So I think that's one of those things going on there. And uh, send him over to his boy Dan Mullen, his former OC. Now he's at Florida. I don't think he is the answer. We threw that question up there as I was talking. I mean, I saw his film. If you look at his film compared to just even Tate Martell last year or you know Justin Fields, Trevor Lawrence this year, it looks like uh, pros versus like middle school kids. And I think that's the big issue for Florida is how long they've been searching for an actual replacement for Tim Tebow. Yeah. Like they haven't really replaced him with that high-level guy that can truly go out and win them. Not just an SEC East title, but have them compete with Alabama and compete with now with Georgia. If Emory isn't that guy, I don't know if it's Felipe Franks or Felipe Franks. Like it's the quarterback position continues to be a gigantic question mark for the Gators. Well, just think about since Team Tebow, you've got Cam Newton, now you've got Will Greer, guys who went on to all conference, if not all Brissette. American, uh, yeah, Jacoby Brissett as well, uh, level play at other schools. Think about the University of Texas, too. We've talked about this at length for the last couple of years, Tom, of all the guys they've let slip away from the state of Texas to other schools and all the quarterback issues they've had since about 2008, 2009. Uh, Texas, Florida, biggest states in the school, country outside of California for recruiting, can't get a quarterback. I don't think Emory Jones is the guy. And with that, uh, I don't rank this Florida class as high as some others do all right the Gators coming in at number 17 let's keep it rolling here at number 16 we've got the Florida State Seminoles under new co head coach Willie Taggart now guys well I mean he's, he's definitely hung out to us the guys some of the guys they've had most of the recent announcements that have had the opportunity to go Florida State's way have not uh, necessarily gone the way of Willie Taggart so he hasn't necessarily made the big impact now he's only been a year out of the state so I think a lot of his relationships with high schools uh, and high school coaches and players are still there so I would expect Florida State to be a big player in the 2019 recruiting yeah. class probably a big player in this early next few months where you have a lot of those junior days uh, but if they can get one or two more guys in the stretch they'll stay in the top 20 but what's hurting them is that they just lost so many guys so many guys that were close to committing to them all of a sudden went somewhere else like Clemson or Miami or Florida so with that being said, Florida State with only 14 guys, unless the, out of nowhere they're going to get five or six more recruits, this is as high as they're going to go. I don't see any way they get any higher than 16. Uh, you know, Asante Samuel Jr., another one of those guys, Tom, like Joe Horn's son. Just a name you know from yeah. uh, great Patriots Super Bowl championships of, uh, of days past. So he will be the one to watch. Probably an instant impact guy from uh, Southern Florida, Fort Lauderdale, uh, uh, Southern Florida, South Florida, mm -hmm. Fort Lauderdale. Committed to Florida State all the way back in April. Stuck with him through the transition from Jimbo Fisher to Willie Taggart. And the Jimbo Fisher, this class, I don't think he did a good job setting up Willie Taggart for success. Like, it was very poorly ranked. They kind of rose in the top 20, 20, 25 hours of late, but when we first started our National Saturday stuff, they were nowhere to be found. Mm -hmm. Like, FSU was one of the biggest losers. They've kind of rebounded since then, but even then, 16 is now where FSU is supposed to be. They're supposed to be in the top 10. Taggart is going to probably have a down class, but we know how good of a recruiter he is. We saw what he did at Oregon before he left. He should get them back in the top five like you mentioned, James. I would love to see some documentary someday, kind of from September 1st when they lost uh, to Alabama through him taking that Texas A&M job. Just what the heck happened at Florida State this year? All kinds of rumors about his marriage situation, his son, all those different things. 30 how, for 30. <laughs> well, uh, 20 for 20, Tom. It's our new series. Not related <laughs> to any other series out there launching in 2020, actually, like the XFL. <laughs> all right, you guys. Before we take it to into the top 15, let's go ahead and recap what we have so far at number 25 we've got maryland followed by baylor nebraska virginia tech and tcu into the top 20 we've got south carolina followed by tennessee ucla florida and florida state jim harbaugh and the wolverines come in you guys at number 15 James well, I, f I feel like I'm a member of this Michigan football recruiting class because we've been talking to so many of the recruits yeah. in the last week. Uh, I've had guys like Aiden Hutchinson, Jalen Mayfield. We'll talk with them both. We'll air those interviews on our signing day uh, show next week. But, uh, you know, this, this Michigan recruiting class I think has been undervalued because it's been smaller. Jim Harbaugh has really loaded up with that over-signing the last two years, Tom, in 16 and 17. Maybe the best two classes Michigan's had in over a decade, seeing the results in the field. A lot of those 2016 guys got the start uh, in this past season, 2017, expected to star next year. But, you know, Otis Reese is the, the question mark here, right? Visited Georgia yeah. last week. If he sticks around, then he is a guy that can potentially uh, be a very early impact player. He'll be the star of the recruiting class, but he's not the only 
only linebacker that Michigan has. They've got another guy uh, that some are calling a five-star, depending on what service you go by, not a five-star in, uh, in the composite. Joe Milton, the quarterback, one that uh, doesn't really fit the mold of Jim Harbaugh, kind of a, a slower Cam Newton, but a really big-bodied guy. But Jim Harbaugh, it's a down year for him if they don't get back into the top ten next year. I don't know if I ever see him competing long-term with Urban Meyer, considering how well Urban Meyer – I mean, Urban Meyer and, and Nick Saban are basically recruiting out of this world. Saban's had a little bit of a down year for Alabama's concern. But if you take the last five years combined, those two schools are kind of, you know, a, you know, just a, a stratosphere above everyone else in college football. With a down class like this from Jim Harbaugh, down considering what he did the last two years, top five, top six, six classes, he's got to come back in 2019 with a top five class if he's going to you know, consistently compete with Ohio State in the long term. Let's assume that Otis Reese doesn't go to Michigan, so we'll leave him out of this equation. But James, who do you think ends up being the best recruit from this class for the <sighs> Wolverines. Well, I, the guy we have right there, Miles, uh, uh, Miles Sims. So they call him Spider for a reason. He's great out, He's out of the state of Georgia also. Jim Harbaugh has done a great job out of the state of Georgia since he's been there. Uh, you know, has gotten recruits, five-star guy uh, in 2017. Now he's coming back with Reese and Sims if they can, if they can hold on to Reese. But I like Sims as that next David Long, Lavert Hill, Jordan Lewis guy who will kind of step in in year two, be a three-year starter, and go on to the NFL as a first or second round draft pick. He was one of the early commits time. Great size for a cornerback, six foot three, two hundred ish pounds. Depending on if he can, he's put any weight his senior year. Can be a, definitely a guy who will not redshirt in two thousand and eighteen. We'll get on some special teams. Might see some snaps like Ambry Thomas did this year for Michigan. Michigan comes in at number fifteen on the top twenty five top twenty five two thousand eighteen recruiting classes presented by Man Crates. Guys, let's keep it rolling. At number fourteen, we've got the Oregon Ducks. One notable player to mention up there. Safety Steve Stevens, one of the premier safeties in the country, able to line up against slot receivers and be a huge pre presence defending the pass. Tom, looks like you're about you to know, say something. I'm <laughs> just like, on an overall general note beyond football, uh -huh. if Steve your last, Stevens? Yeah, yes, if yeah. I knew you were going to say. If your last name thing. is Stevens, why would you name your son Steve? Like, yeah. Like, why are you having his first name and his last name the same? I just don't understand this. Jordan, yeah. if you have a brother and his name is George, I would probably be saying yeah. the same thing. George, George, yeah, yeah. Tom, Thompson, whatever. Like, yeah, it's, it is bizarre. brutal. James, Jameson, yeah, I don't get it either, Tom. Mm -hmm. I think that's all we need to spend on Oregon yeah. class. Just kidding, but <laughs> no. brutal, na brutal naming there. Yeah. Uh, but, but you know, surprised that they kept 22 classes. Mario mm -hmm. Cristobal, we know he is a great recruiter. That's what he's been known for, probably better than his X's and O's, that he was the recruiter at Alabama under Nick Saban for a period of time, uh, got his shot. Uh, as a head coach, that didn't work out. Tom, I know you've uh, you've talked about that. Tyler Shuck, is that how we're pronouncing yes, it? Give right. us a it's thumbs Shuck. up. It's Shuck. It's Shuck. Uh, our own Lena Bond. Don't know how, but it's Shuck. Yeah, interviewed him uh, in this week. Called Oregon one of his dream schools, one of several dream schools he's had. I'm not sure he can have multiple dream schools, but he is a guy who saw his stock rise as high as any quarterback his senior year. Was an underrated guy as a junior. Uh, really turned it on in some of these Elite 11 style, you know, passing camps over the summer and had a great senior year out of the state of Arizona, headed up north to. Oregon, I don't think he's going to be an instant impact guy from day one, of course, because they've got a starting quarterback coming back at Oregon, but he is the one that if they're going to win Pac-12 titles under Mario Cristobal in the future, Tyler Shucks to be the guy who's going to lead, lead, him, lead him to the promised land. All right, Mario Cristobal's Ducks come in at number 14. At number 13, guys, we got the Washington Huskies. Right. Yeah, I mean, so Washington Sorry. Huskies, I mean, this is the second best class in the Pac-12, and for a reason. They've got 19 total recruits, have dropped one spot from th uh, 12 down to 13 since our December 20th show. Nine four-star recruits. I am always so impressed when Oregon and Washington are able to get these, you know, top-level classes recruiting in the Northeast where they have almost no I'm sorry, Northwest, where they have almost no in-state talent uh, in the high school time. So they've got to recruit from Southern California, Northern California, Nevada, Arizona. They can't just kind of walk out and say, hey, you grew up an Oregon fan. You grew up a Washington fan. Your daddy loved Oregon. And come on to our school. Like schools like Ohio State, Michigan, Florida, Florida State, all these schools that have been doing it for, for many years. Their talent in the Northwest part of the country is as bad as they can get. Maybe up there with like New Mexico and some of these kind of Southwest states outside it's, of Arizona. I'd say it's worth new, worse than New Mexico. Yeah, probably, yeah, probably. <laughs> Is. And so when they can Where does Alaska fit into this? Well, they're more of a basketball. <laughs> Trajan, Langdon, Carlos Boozer, they've come go. out there. For some reason, go to Duke. I'm not sure how that works out. Uh, probably because Coach K is undoubtedly paying his players, we've seen, with their 2018 recruiting class. But, you know, 19 guys. 
three four-star recruit. I'm sorry, three uh, nine four-star recruits, three top hundred guys, and two quarterbacks, two four-star quarterbacks. Top one of them out of the state of Idaho, which is very and, rare. And this is fascinating to me. They're getting guys like Colson Yankov, who's a very highly touted kid. He's in the top 100. He's a bit of a dual threat. Again, you don't see many guys coming in from Idaho. That's just very unusual. In addition to to Yankov and and, and Sermon, Yankov, of course, being an elite name. Don't forget that they're also bringing in Jacob Eason as a transfer. Yeah. So all of a sudden, Washington next year, when Jake Browning graduates, they're still flush with quarterback talent. This is uh, this is borderline becoming like a Stanford situation to me, James, where they're bringing in year in and year out top 100 recruits a quarterback almost every year. Yeah, I mean, Chris Peterson, though, he is – one of the gold standard coaches in college football. You saw the impact he made, Tom, in 2016, making the playoffs. Had a little bit of a down year, surprising down year this year. But if he can recruit at the top level, we saw what he did at Boise State. If he can recruit at the top level at Washington, there is no question that they're going to win a national title, in my opinion, in his tenure as coach in the next few years. I really want to see what this recruiting class will do. Because if you look at the last three or four years, he has not had the impact on the recruiting trail as much as he's had on really the actual field. This recruiting class is really the first one for me that has, you know, uh, top to bottom talent that all the other schools, the Pac-12 and the Big 12 are going after. And we mentioned Colson Yankoff, probably the name of the year. Probably got made fun of a lot when he was a kid for that last name. <laughs> the Huskies land that number 13 spot. Guys, coming in at number 12 is LSU. A guy that I want to mention, mention up there is wide receiver Terrace Marshall, number three wide receiver in the nation and number one wide receiver in the state of Louisiana. I showed it's coming back on our early signing day period special. And, and Marshall... Well, the big thing for LSU in general is they still got to get better quarterback play. They recruit receivers really well. They churn them out at a pretty good rate, but they always suffer from just having bad quarterback play. And I think, once again, that's the big issue for LSU in this class is Who's their quarterback? Yeah, exactly. I mean, they don't have one. That, that's the problem. And you get rid of Matt Canada, and which is a still don't understand befuddling that. move to say the least that 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 they have that. But um, you know. It's again, you think about Terrace Marshall, you think back to Odell Beckham Jr., you're going to see over a 10-year period at LSU, they're going to have like three all-pro you know, uh, wide receivers over a 10-year period probably, and almost no you know, redeemable quarterback play to speak of. And so it's very similar to Texas, very similar to Florida, is I just can't comprehend how some of these schools that basically can almost pick and choose who they want cannot have quarterback play. But then you see schools like Oklahoma State, Oklahoma, that Baylor. don't – Baylor, that are not in these recruiting hotbeds that basically – no matter what, have a top college football or top quarterback every single year, year in, year out. Speaks to coaching. I didn't think Ed O was the guy for the job then. I still don't think he's the guy for the job now. And frankly, I think he's going to be one who's on the super hot heat in year two in 2018. Interesting enough, LSU this year added two notable Juco guys. They went on and they got the number four Juco defensive and Trevez Moore and the number five Juco Debar Traore and off the tackle from New York. LSU doesn't always go that Juco route. And by the way, I think if we once we get to our, the actual sign today, mm -hmm. LSU is still in the mix for some other notable prospects and, and recruits. They could sneak in the top ten here. Patrick Sertain Jr., is he the one still out there, I think? I think that's the one we're talking about yes. later, yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. LSU comes in at number 12. Moving on at number 11, USC Trojans, guys. They've got, I believe, 13, 14 players committed right now. Tom, what can you tell us about USC, that? USC, I think, has been one of the biggest risers since we mm -hmm. began when we first started really looking at this before the early National Signing Day period. They have really risen up, and it's in part because of some notable five-star recruits. We'll start with Amonra St. Brown. First off, comes from a family full of great names. Yep. You probably recognize the St. Brown in a weird first name because yep. if you watch Notre Dame football, Equinemius St. Brown, a.k.a. EQ St. Brown, much easier. Yep. He went to Notre Dame. The younger St. Brown wanted to go his own route. He ended up going to USC. He could be their next really good wide receiver. Yeah, talk about JT Daniels, Tom. Oof. This is a kid who is a high school junior but is going to graduate an entire Looks year like early. Looks like Yeah, I mean, everything. <laughs> and there was an article uh, a few months back by, by one of these recruiting gurus that said JT Daniels was like the truth, the LeBron of football. And there's been a lot of those guys actually, but after reclassifying though, he popped up from you know not being you know ranked, of course, as a senior because he wasn't one, but the number six player in the final like recruiting rankings for 2018. So he is an interesting thing. I don't find the value in leaving high school early, especially as a uh, as a quarterback. I think you need all the reps you can get. I don't know why you'd want to kind of cloud the the depth chart by bringing a guy year early, but if he is that good, we'll. See See what happens. I, I think it would be dis, 
it would be not a good thing for USC to put him on the field in year one. He really needs to rest sure. Uh, they brought in a guy, Max Brown, in their cir- similar circumstances, uh, not necessarily graduating early, but brought him in, very similar uh, build, frame, hype as, uh, a- a- as we're getting from JT Daniels. Uh, about six years ago, I believe, from the state of Washington, never did anything. So Daniels really needs to pack on the pounds in the weight room if he's ever going to see the field at USC. A couple more quick thoughts for me on USC is I actually wouldn't totally discount Daniels getting some playing time early as a freshman because, remember, Sam Darnold's gone, mm-hmm. and I think it's a bit of a question mark at USC for quarterback, and I think they sold Daniels on enrolling early of like, hey, we'll let you actually compete for this job. Mm-hmm. And if you win it, all of a sudden you're a three-year starter, and you're like 20 years old, and NFL teams are going to love you as a quarterback. Well, it's, I, I, we'll see what happens. I just can't imagine a high school senior – being able to, you know, uh, have, understand the intricacies of the quarterback play at a, at a pro style system like USC going against Pac-12 defenses. So we'll see what happens, though. I mean, it's only a couple months away from spring ball, and, and maybe you'll have an opportunity uh, going into the fall to get that job. Maybe most importantly, USC has two different name of the year candidates at recruiting. We, we mentioned uh, Amon or St. Brown. They've also got linebacker, a five-star Paula Ia Naote Ote. Yeah, he's phenom- gonna be a stud. Phenomenal, and it's surprising <laughs> and to I see them that guys. By the way. Only 14 players. Those three five-star recruits really bolsters their class up into the top 11. If they had a bigger class, they would be in the top five for sure. This is the example of how quantity can help raise you, but this is where quality will still shine through for the recruiting service rankings. Absolutely. The Trojans come in at number 11, guys. Let's take it to a quick weigh-in here before we go ahead and recap with teams that we have so far. What team's recruiting class has been disappointed yeah. Des- disappointed you so well for me it's Michigan State right mm-hmm. and there's there's a reason for this is because one I mean they're going under different issues right now that have really nothing to do with the recruiting class uh, both their basketball and football programs are under a lot of scrutiny based on off the field things but Michigan State was a, re- a, a, a school that I just can't understand why they can't break through get even into the top 25 get into the top 30 they're always kind of hovering in that 35 40 sometimes as low as 50 range now they're doing as good of a job as anybody probably ever at developing guys taking three and two star players but I just can't understand how in the Midwest where you've got you know all these schools but you've got a ton of talent in Ohio and beyond that a team that was in the playoff two years ago and finished you know 10 and 3 in 2017, cannot make a bigger impact in the recruiting uh, trail, cannot get four stars, never get a five-star guy out of I mean, Once every three years, they get a homegrown sky from the state of Michigan. But that is the most disappointing class to me. I thought a year removed from that playoff appearance time, you'd see them in the top 15, top 20. And Jim Harbaugh, you know, can't beat him in the field this year, but he's still beating them for the best recruits in the Midwest that they're both going after. You know, if you'd asked me this a month ago, I think USC would have been on this list. Mm-hmm. But I look at another Pac-12 school, Stanford. I know that Stanford isn't always going to be the dynamic recruiting class because they are very much hamstrung by their academic standards but they're 52nd yeah they're behind Rutgers like that that's just not what I would ever expect to see from Stanford I at least expect them to be even in a down year when it's not a, a big quality class like I still think that they'd end up being top 35 right yeah I mean only four four-star four-star guys it's in the 24-7 composite and that's a lot lower than they have and we've seen Stanford in the past guys get multiple five-star guys, and they really had a, a challenge this year. They didn't do as well in the offensive line as they've seen in the past. I mean, the Stanford offensive line, the recruiting has been as good as anybody over the past six, seven years. Didn't really come through as much this year, but, you know, Jack West, the quarterback coming in, he's the star of the class, but as we've talked about before, they basically brought in the best one or two quarter, you know, one of the best two or three quarterbacks in the entire country for three straight classes, so West is going to be under a very deep depth chart with K.J. Costello coming back for year three in Stanford. A lot of guys, uh, you know, vying for that starting position at Stanford, you know, down the line 2018 and beyond. All right, you guys, before we get into the top 10 recruiting classes of 2018, let's go ahead and recap what we have so far. At number 25, we've got Maryland, followed by Baylor, Nebraska, Virginia Tech, and TCU. Coming in at number 20 is South Carolina, followed by Tennessee, UCLA, Florida, and Florida State. Into the top 15, we've got Michigan, followed by Oregon, Washington, LSU, and the USC Trojans coming in at number 11. If you're just joining us, you are watching College Football Daily. We are breaking down the top 25 recruiting classes of 2018 presented by Man Crate's awesome gift packages for guys delivered in a wooden crate. Guys, I'm talking jerky grams, project kits, and barware, and much more. You can go ahead and get one today at mancrates.com. The jerky is really delicious, by the way. The gator jerky, highly, highly recommend okay. it. Tom, I saw they've got uh, I really dug into some of the products. I'm buying a few man crates uh, for some folks in my life. We've got some birthdays coming up. A couple like a work anniversary for a friend of mine. So I saw they've got like a brewery 
brewery kit. You can brew your own beer. It's I'm a big not smart one. enough for that. Also, like some sort of pizza making man crates. I'm really now interested to get into that one. Like you buy a man crate, you pop it open with that crowbar, you rip this box apart, keep it if you can because it makes a cool decoration around the house or the apartment. But then you're brewing, brewing beer, you're making pizza. Just awesome stuff. I love man crates. The best way to get guy, gifts for guys this holiday season. And by the way, get a gift for yourself. I mean, if you're going to go out there and shop, might as well get yourself like a brewery kit from man crates. The best money you can probably spend if you're getting yourself a little personal gift, maybe even this Valentine's Day, you if you're uh, single out there. <laughs> Man Crates is the way to go. Guys, with any further ado, let's go ahead and take it into the top 10. Coming in at number 10 is the Auburn Tigers, guys. Well, so uh, Joey Gatewood is the, the guy that I want to focus on in this class. He is going to be, I think, the quarterback down the line, guys. I mean, he's listed as an athlete. Big, big guy, 6'4", 232. We've seen big quarterbacks. Program weight, Yeah, just we've saying. Seen, we've seen big guys thrive at, uh, at Auburn uh, in prior years, mostly quarterback, mostly Cam Newton. But to get a guy, gosh, I can't imagine being 6'4", 230 and being able, be able to throw the ball like Joey Gatewood. I was actually surprised how low he was ranked. I mean, a, a guy that size who can make these kind of throws, uh, usually he's in the top 10 or top 15 players in the country. He has been knocked for his accuracy, Tom, so maybe that's why maybe people don't see he can run that but in Gus Malzahn's system you don't necessarily have to be the most accurate quarterback you have to throw shorter routes shorter out routes uh, it's more about deception than it is about like accuracy down the field but this is a guy we're going to be talking about for the Heisman in two or three years in that system at Auburn I will not ever trust an Auburn quarterback again until they go out and actually prove it on the field for me because I'm still feeling this, the side effects of believing in Jeremy Johnson yep. and you mentioned Gatewood look Gus Malzahn comped him to Cam Newton like, yep. that's a lot of high-pressure expectations on, on one kid. This is, again, a very, I guess, typical Auburn class. A bunch of four-star recruits. Maybe not quite as heavy on the five-star guys, but this is why Auburn is typically in the mix in the SEC and, of course, in the National Championship Yeah, he's going to be throwing to Matthew Hill, another player I like. So, totally two top 100 recruits, which is less than you want to see for, mm -hmm. for Auburn. If they're going to compete with Georgia and Alabama, you're gonna, you're, they're going to need five, six, seven classes, but they're top 100 guys. But number 10 overall recruiting class, if you do that every year, year and out, that's the talent level you need to beat Alabama like they did this year, compete for an SEC and ultimately a national champion. And I think uh, this class keeps Auburn right in that mix. You shouldn't see any talent drop off with them, you know, into 2018 and beyond with these guys. All right, Auburn lands that number 10 spot. Moving on at number nine, you guys, we've got Notre Dame. Right now they've got 22 players committed, no five-star guys ever, as of right now, but 11 four-star recruits. One guy to mention up there is Houston Griffith. He'll be coming on the program for our signing day special next Wednesday. Friend of the show. Friend of the show. Has the length and timing to compete with these bigger receivers. A great get for the Irish. Yeah, Phil Jerkovic is another guy that I really like. The quarterback play under Notre Dame has been, it's been hit or miss. Yeah, it's been inconsistent. So when they have great quarterback play or even decent quarterback play, you can see uh, some Irish teams like the 2012 one or even this past year for, for, for most of the time where they can, you know, be into the top 10, compete for a national title, get within, you know, really Notre Dame was a few outside that Miami game. If they would have hold out, hung out against Stanford and, you know, they, they had an opportunity to compete for a playoff spot this year, losing a ton of talent. So Jerkovic's a guy long term. He's not going to start in 2018, but if they're going to make it back to the playoff, he's going to be in that competition. I like what I saw out of him. He'll be one. Houston Griffin out of the Chicago went, you know, went out of state for high school. We did the whole go to an academy. I believe IMG, if I'm uh, not mistaken on that mm -hmm. one, I'll have to double check. But Houston Griffin still Sticking around, he's from the Chicago area, and he's going to be an instant impact player for them. I wouldn't be surprised with all the talent they lose on both sides of the ball if he's not in the too deep from day one and maybe stealing a starting job by midseason in 2018. Houston Griffin is that kind of player for the Irish 2018 and beyond. And this is another one of the guys that we see more and more of, more of now at the college level. You see them go from high school to college, college to the NFL. NFL teams and thus college teams and thus high school teams want long and lanky corners. Well, guess what? Houston checks in at 6'1", 192. Mm -hmm. He fits that mold to a T. He's got that ability to be that long and tall guy that can become that dynamic player for Notre Dame going forward. If I, had, if I was the father of a sophomore or junior player who's in the top 100, there's no question about it. If I could you know, have the means to do it, he would be going to IMG Academy because they're putting out 10, 12 you know, D1 players a year, top level, top 150 players a year. If you can do that and playing against a competition is 16, 17, 18 years old, you're going to be that much more set up for college going into your freshman season. And I think IMG's got something really cooking with there. And I think that's why Griffin, for me, is a guy who's going to make an instant impact in 2018. All right, the Irish come in at number nine. Guys, taking it to number eight now, we've got the Clemson Tigers. They are stacked this season. Also, talking about the guys that are coming back this year as well. Yeah, they, make, <laughs> they brought back the best defensive oh, line yeah. I've seen in quite some time. This is the perfect example 
of quality over quantity. Clemson only has 15 guys. When you see 15 guys, for the most part, you're yep. not even in the top 25. Yep. Yet Clemson ranks Inc. eighth because this quality is unbelievable. Five five-star guys led by the number one player in the nation, quarterback Trevor Lawrence, and the number three player, Xavier Thomas, the defensive end. In terms of quality, there is a real argument that, that, that this Clemson class is the best one in the nation. So Trevor Lawrence has been called by plenty of Sunshine. pundits as the best quarterback. I mean, I know I said that for JT Daniels, and those things can be over-exaggerated sometimes, but he's got the highest ranking from 24-7 sports since they've been doing this 15 or so years, going back to when they were scout.com and beyond. So Trevor Lawrence is basically the truth. I would not – I know we've uh, we've talked at length, Tom, you and I, about the Clemson quarterback situation in 2018, your uh, disapproval of it, my maybe a little more rosy outlook on there, but Trevor Lawrence might be the best quarterback recruit we've seen – Definitely coming into the ACC in, in maybe my lifetime, your lifetime, overall in college football. Could he be an instant impact guy from day one? He's got the size. He's got the arm strength. He's got the poise. He has everything. He reminds me of like Peyton Manning with feet, Tom. <laughs> like, I mean, Deshaun Watson was highly touted, but even he was the number one overall recruit in the nation. I mean, look how effortless this throw is. He just... Right to the back of the end zone, 35, 40 yards on the field. It's amazing. He is literally ridiculous. If he didn't have such ridiculously looking hair, I, I think I think he'd be a better player. But <laughs> Sunshine. I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure if that that uh, that, that hairstyle like, kind of fi fits his face necessarily. But uh, <laughs> a little bit longer face there. But uh, but either way, phenomenal player on on, on the field, Tom. Five five-star players. Clemson is not going anywhere for a while. And we're going to start talking about Dallas Sweeney as the second or third best coach in college football. I'm surprised we're not already with the fact that they've made the playoffs three straight years. But with that being said, Jackson Carmen is the get for me out of the state of Ohio, stealing away from Ohio State. Kind of a little bit of a recruiting nugget there. His parents divorced. Dad lives in South Carolina. It's more of a, hey, getting away, going down there, living near okay. dad after being with mom, after uh, you know that, you know, being have mom have the custody. But he is the steal because I don't think anybody thought he was going to Clemson. He was like an Ohio State lock uh, leading up to December 20th. James, I'm curious. Who do you think is the best recruiter in the nation? Because I got, I got a pick here that maybe might be a little bit different than what you say. Uh, say it again, Tom. Who is the best recruiter the in best the nation? Best recruiter, yeah. That's what I thought you said. So, I mean, come on. Um, it's Nick Saban. Are we kidding okay. each other right here? I mean, I know Urban Meyer has done as good of a job as anybody in the last couple of years, but you don't have six or seven straight number one recruiting classes Overall, uh, you know, over a long stretch of time, and then also back that up, having like nine straight number one uh, ranked in the team in the polls over nine straight years that Alabama has had. Tom, if you're not the best recruiter in the country, Nick Saban is not only the best recruiter in college football; he's probably the best recruiter in all of life. I mean, think about it. Even in business, any other walk of life, Nick Saban has done it better than anybody else. This is the first time he's not going to be number one since I think going back to what 2008, nine recruiting class. Tom, that speaks for itself. Yeah, I think Saban's a good argument. I would make a point for Dabo though because Clemson was not the same level of, of talent yep. in terms of overall pr program prestige that an Alabama or even a Georgia or OSU is and yet Dabo's got them competing year in year out they don't reload they don't rebuild they reload every year yeah I mean those three coaches outside of Kirby Smart still has to prove himself to me you know he got uh, he got to the championship game and, and it was within you know overtime of, of winning a national title in year two but these three coaches have really separated themselves in my eyes from the rest of college football on the field recruiting the presence of the program, their ability to reload every single year. I don't think, I don't see it stopping anytime soon with the recruiting class they're bringing in. You're going to be talking about these same three or four teams in the college football playoff for years to come. All right, guys, let's keep it rolling here. Coming in at number seven is Oklahoma. They fell actually from number five to number seven. 22 total co recruits right now. One five-star guy and 11 four-star recruits. Yeah, see, I mean, Bray Walker is the guy, friend of the program, will be on our mm -hmm. signing day special with an interview, although I hear we had some audio issues with him. But five-star guy, 6'7", 320, just a beast of a program of, of a young man. I mean, the 6'7", is, uh, is the size you like to see uh, from an offensive tackle at the time. That screams to me first uh, first round draft pick in the 2021 Maybe NFL not draft. Right? I mean, that's this guy, boy right there. This guy is a beast, <laughs> and, and he's going to be you know anchoring. We've seen the offensive line talent that's come out of Oklahoma, numerous first round picks uh, in, in the Bob Stoops area. Now it's under the large game Lincoln Riley era, and Bray Walker. No different uh, of a story with them. He committed under Bob Stoops, stuck with large game Lincoln, and he's going to be a star. I wouldn't be surprised <laughs> if he starts from day one because of the talent and the size he brings to the offensive line spot in Norman in 2018. Hey, I think Oklahoma got the best out of Orlando Brown. I think they can get the best out of Bray Walker as well. This is about where I think Oklahoma should finish for the most part in recruiting. I think in general the recruiting process kind of skews toward the South and SEC programs. 
So if Oakland will be in the top seven, top ten. This is about where I think they're going to end up and about where they should be each and every year. Because if you finish top seven, you, in theory, should be competing every single year for, for a college football title. championship. Yeah, absolutely. And then and that's what they've basically been doing in, in, in Lincoln Riley. Large game Lincoln, I'll say it over and over. I'm going to coin that. Someone's going to use it other than me one point, Tom. But he is, uh, you know, no drop-off from Bob Stoops with, with him in year one. Made it to the playoff, now a top seven recruiting class. Bray Walker uh, anchoring that uh, class. And Oklahoma is going to bring it with this 2018 recruiting class. The Sooners. Come in at number seven. Moving on, guys, at number six, we've got the Alabama Crimson Tide. They've got 18 players committed right now. One five-star guy and 14 four-star recruits. Well, for, you know, for me with this class, guys, just to kind of talk about where they're at, I mean, we've got a Yabi, a Noma. I know, Proud Jordan, you're going to say this, and mm -hmm. Stefan Wynn yeah, is – we are going to find out if this is a top two or three class or the number six, seven, eight recruiting class mm -hmm. over the next week because they are basically in. If you look at the top 100 players in the country, who hasn't signed yet, who hasn't committed somewhere else, have a logo next to their name in the recruiting rankings, Alabama is on every single one of them. They're top three, four, five schools. So I could see them adding multiple five stars, but then a whole slew of four stars. Have some, some room. They've got 18 guys committed. I could see them adding as many as six or seven players. We might see that top 100 from three up to six, seven, eight. That top three where they can make a big impact. We could see that number not be 12. We could see it being 16, 17, 18 by the end of this recruiting class. And you could see them vault from six all the way up to the top three. Maybe not the top two. I think the top two teams are pretty much sad. Yeah. I don't see any way we get above them. But I would not be surprised if Alabama did it just like Bobby Bowden used to do in the old days where you think that they're going to be in number six, seven, eight. All of a sudden they come in with like six guys on sign day. You're like, how the heck did they get that class? And so with that being said, I mean, I, I look for Alabama to make big splashes coming up on sign I mean, day. it's weird because most teams across Austin, they should be like six, number six class, perfect. I'll take that each and every year. For yeah. Alabama, it's like, what, what do we do wrong? Yeah, surprising. Why are we not number surprising, one again? Like, right? it, yeah. It's weird. Yeah, very surprising. <laughs> but overall, I think this is this is a, a solid Alabama classic again here. And a, look, what, what do they need? More defensive talent, apparently, and that's what they've got again this year with guys like Walker, Wynn, and Anoma. The yep. Crimson Tide land that number six spot. All right, guys, we're getting down to the wire. Before we get into the top five, let's go ahead and recap what we have so far at number 25. We've got Maryland followed by Baylor, Nebraska, Virginia Tech, and TCU at number 21. And to the top 20 is South Carolina followed by Tennessee, UCLA, Florida, and Florida State. And to the top 15 is Michigan followed by Oregon, Washington, LSU, and USC. At number 10, we've got Auburn, followed by Notre Dame, Clemson, Oklahoma, and Alabama. If you're just joining us, you are watching College Football Daily. We are breaking down the top 25 recruiting classes of 2018 presented by Man Crates. Awesome gift packages for guys delivered in a wooden crate. Guys, I'm talking jerky grams, barware, and project hits, and so much more. And you can go ahead and get one today at mancrates.com. Yeah, I mean, I gave plenty for uh, for uh, Christmas time. I, I I don't know if I'm I don't know if it is you're a lazy you, shopper. Yeah, it's, it's, it's okay to admit it. No one is lazier shopping than me, Tom. Mm -hmm. If I never went to a store again in my life, it would be too soon. But I will tell you this: Is it okay for like? Can you get a guy a Valentine's? Can you like dude to dude Valentine's Day present? Because if you do, Man Crates is the only way to do it because it's like a, a masculinity thing. I love shopping at Man Crates. It is the best way because you know. If there's, it's just no, no guessing. What's the guy like? Boom. They've got a box for it of testosterone. Pop that bad boy open with a crowbar, and you've just got instant satisfaction from the gift mm -hmm. receiver. Man, Crates is the way to go. All right, guys, let's get into the top five now. Coming in at number five are the Miami Hurricanes. Are they going to be back again in 2018? It looks like it. I'd say they're already back. <laughs> and I think Miami in general is one of the, the beneficiaries of when the recruiting services go ahead and update their rankings. Yep. And they, they rose in the, in the composite. A couple of different guys took big jumps up, up in there. Uh, one of the guys that I, I, I want to mention quickly before we get into some more specific players, mm -hmm. uh, Nesta Silvera is a longtime pledge. He was out to the top 100, jumped into the top 55 after the updated rankings. Same with quarterback Jaron Williams. But, of course, the big guy here in the end is five-star running back Lorenzo Lingar, the number 22 overall recruit in the nation. He is going to be a stud for Miami. Mark Walton has left. You could see Lingard get playing time very early in his career, and that would not surprise me whatsoever. Now, Lingard is a freak of nature, Tom. I just can't – I can't – 
comprehend sometimes who he reminds you of. Some days I watch his film and I think, oh gosh, it's Adrian Peterson. Other day I say Leonard Fournette. Other days I, I think he's somebody else. Like Zeke Elliott, he has speed, he has power. I've seen him crush guys, line screamers. I've seen him take 90 yards run to the house. He could be one of these instant impact freshmen that everyone's like, holy cow, where did this guy come from? Like a Jonathan Taylor uh, uh, this year and other guys in past years. This Miami class is stud filled and we talked about uh, a lot of guys enrolling early, but Jaron Williams, he is the quarterback that enrolled early. He'll be in spring ball. I know that uh, Miami, they benched the quarterback for the second half of that pick game. There's some questions about whether or not uh, he would get the job back, but I don't think they'd be well served starting a true freshman quarterback, but you never know if he's yeah. in campus early, can compete in spring ball, see what he has out there. So that's Miami. That's our number five class. Sauce in the comments, Will. Four-star tight end, Brevin Jordan. Miami has a very good history of bringing in very talented tight ends and producing ones as well. I think Jordan's going to be that next guy for the Al Blades mm -hmm. Jr. too. Yes. Also, rumor has it that five-star running back Lorenzo Lingard might be making an appearance on our Sunday Day show next Ooh. Wednesday, so make sure to turn, tune in. But the Hurricanes land that number five spot. Guys, let's keep it rolling. At number four, we've got James Franklin's Nittany Lions. One guy, I mean, we got to mention is five-star defensive end Micah Parsons, number five overall player in the nation, number two weak side defensive end. You know, imagine what would have happened to Penn State if they had been able to keep Justin Fields. This is still a great class, and right. I, I don't want to minimize what Penn State has done because they've done a fantastic job, but what if? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, they would have, it would have taken away what George has done, knocked mm -hmm. a five-star up there. And maybe when you get that five-star quarterback, you see things cascade. You get other guys who want to be part of that hype train. Maybe Georgia wouldn't have got some of those guys on the stretch. Penn State could be up there in the number one, two spot with that class. I mean, just think about it. They, if they would have lost Parsons, they would have basically lost two of the top five players because Fields and Parsons were recruited, committed them both as juniors, and now, uh, you know, Parsons stick with him, but three five-star, I mean, Ricky Slade, Justin Shorter, unfortunately, Joe Moorhead for them has moved on, but if they can keep that offensive, you know, ingenuity and, and just remarkable offensive play calling under, uh, under in the future that they had under Moorhead continuing, I mean, this offense is going to be well set up for success in the future. Shorter and Slade should see a lot of playing time with as much skill position and talent that they lost uh, after 2017, and then, you know, Micah Parsons announced, uh, you know, we, we broadcast his announcement on the Cam Rogers show on December 20th. I don't think it was a Surprised anybody they picked Penn State after looking around Ohio State. He tricked us there, wasn't though. It? Yeah, he did trick with <laughs> yeah, all those different, uh, yeah. all those different hats and jerseys and such. But uh, Ohio State was not able to recruit him. We know because that self-reported violation ends up at Penn State, and it's just a phenomenal class. I mean, it really is for Penn State, number four in the country, and I think these guys are going to be studs in the Big Ten in years to come. All right, keeping it rolling here. Coming in at number three, we've got the Texas Longhorns. Guys, they got two five-star guys committed right now, 16 four-star recruits. The theme of this class for Texas is plain and simple. It is all about defensive backs and, re and receivers. Yep. Their top nine recruits play defensive back or receiver, which is kind of unreal to think about. Caden Stearns leapt over B.J. Foster in the, in the final update for the player uh, recruiting rankings and the composite ranks. He is now their top recruit, five-star, number 19 overall. But Texas has done a great job of recruiting secondary guys as of late. Caden Stearns, B.J. Foster, Jalen Green. This is the, the next batch of really good Texas guys at a, in the secondary that you see playing on Sundays. And Tom, we saw it when Mac Brown came in 1998 through about 2007. Basically, they would have their entire recruiting class, you know, finalized by about May of their junior year. They they, they, they invented the junior day, Texas did. Yes. And Tom Herman, he was an assistant. He was a, a, a grad assistant during those days. He learned from Mac Brown, came in and basically did the same thing. And I was a little worried about this class a little early on. You heard some rumblings that uh, Herman was doing things a different way, rubbed some people, alumni, high school coaches the wrong way. But this recruiting recruiting class speaks for itself. The depth that you've got under the great Mac Brown recruiting classes of a decade plus ago. Tom, where you need players, their defense, the secondary, they've been torched by some of these Big 12 offenses. They need a lot of help in the secondary. Need help at wide receiver to may have some playmakers at offense. And this recruiting class, and they're already off to a great start by 19. This, They're building the foundation for a national championship down the line. Texas, Tom, I'm going to say right now, I'm going to say right now, they're back because right. this recruiting <laughs> class is going to bring them that back. It's one of the better ones I've seen. If not for Ohio State, uh, in these two classes we're going to talk about here in a moment, all time level classes. Texas could have, you know, potentially sneaked in there as the number one class in 2018. The Longhorns come in at number three. Coming in at number two on our top 25 2018 recruiting classes. On, uh, presented by Man Crates are the Georgia Bulldogs. Guys, they got 22 total co recruits committed right now. Yeah, I mean, this class, talk about amazing. I mean, they are just five-star stacked. Justin Fields, Zamir White, Cade Mays out of Knoxville, was a Tennessee commit for a long time, flipped it, didn't like the uncertainty of that program. I mean, the offensive talent in this class is as good as it's ever been. Zam Zamir, Zamar, I don't know how to pronounce it, but I Zamir. pronounce it basically just touchdown White. That's what we're going to be saying for the next three years. Uh, 
at Georgia. Kirby Smart, I mean, the year he had, does anybody in sports have a better year, I guess, outside of maybe some guys who won titles? But his 2017 was as good as it gets. Goes Two ahead eight of five, eight and five to the national championship game against his mentor. Then this all-time recruiting class. That day on December 20th, them and Clemson basically kind of rewrote what, you know, they basically set the tone for future early signing days that had never happened before. The first year of that early signing day period, this recruiting class for Georgia is all-time. It's the one they need to win that game against Alabama, to be dominant, to really take Alabama's spot as a dominant program in college football after Nick Saban retires, if he ever does retire. Kirby Smart's a young guy, early 40s. He's got 10, 15 years. He could be at the top of his game in college football. Georgia's class is one for the ages, Justin Fields as well. All right, taking it now to the number one recruiting class of 2018. We've got the Ohio State Buckeyes, guys. They have 24 players committed right now. One guy to mention is Jalen Gill, number two all-purpose back in the nation, who will also be making an appearance on Signing Day Show special next Wednesday. Yeah, friend of the program, Jalen Gill. Uh, just, he's going to be take over that role that uh, Curtis Samuels did in 2016 for Ohio State, that uh, Percy Harvin style role in Ohio State's offense. I love this recruiting class for Ohio State. I mean, this, uh, again, I, I like to say National championships are won in two years, two year buckets. The 2017 and 2018 recruiting class for Ohio State is as good as you're ever going to see in college football. Back to back top two classes. Now they may end up dropping the spot. You don't know what's going to happen on the stretch. Some guys might commit to Georgia. Some guys might commit elsewhere. But this Ohio State recruiting class is number one. 2008 recruiting class presented by Chat Sports, uh, and I just love what we've got coming from. I can't say enough about what Urban Meyer has done in 2018, guys. Well, that was college football daily. Thank you you so much for watching presented by man crates that was your top 25 recruiting classes of 2018 make sure to go ahead and follow chat sports on twitter facebook and instagram and while you're at it go ahead and follow us as well thanks so much for joining us my name is jordan giorgio alongside tom downey and james yoder but until next time we'll see you